live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, Tuesday, May 2nd, 2017, and uh, trying to get everything up and running here for the morning so we can uh, get the show underway. Looking to start the tweet deck on the desktop computer, but uh, apparently the keys got stuck, so I'm waiting for my tweet. I don't know. That's, it just got stuck, and it just started doing the ease over and over again. So, uh, all right, just about catching up here, uh, getting everything up and online. Good morning to you, Bill from Portland, Maine, letting everybody know Daily Coast Radio is live now, even if the E key is stuck. Kager X, that's me. David Waldman openly wonders if Lincoln was troubled by World War One. I. I bet he was. He, he was so angry. He was so furious. He just uh, he he was ready to rise from the grave. And do something about it. Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting. We're still in the uh, 1830s spin cycle this morning as, uh, I guess, Trump defenders uh, are attempting to add some sort of context that would maybe kind of sort of make part of what Trump said yesterday, or I guess uh, what was released about what he had said the day before and was released yesterday, uh, make some kind of sense. Although, I've been seeing the name of a couple, uh, well, at least one, I guess, prominent historian and Andrew Jackson biographer being bandied about as some sort of context that will help us understand what Trump was really trying to say. Except uh, then I also saw a couple of interviews online uh, with this historian basically saying, no, I mean, without reacting directly to what Trump was saying, but rather uh, keeping it rather oblique, saying, yeah, uh, he doesn't really understand exactly what's going on. He, he, there's a seed of the kernel of truth to some of what he said, but it has something to do with something else. And uh, he's basically conflating all of his facts and uh, has everything confused. I, I believe the the way he put it was that he was living in a snowstorm of information, really kind of unable to synthesize uh, what was out there in any coherent fashion. Uh, I, I don't really, I guess, I mean, we could dig into what that was about. I don't know how, uh, how interested are you in, in whether or not there's any sense at all to the Andrew Jackson thing? I found the whole thing a little bit strange, uh, in that, well, I recall that, uh, President Trump, <clears throat> I guess I'm sort of getting used to saying that, uh, I recall that he, uh, he let everybody know that he was, very, uh, what? He was, uh, very, uh, uh, upset in some way that, uh, not everybody knew. I don't know if everybody knew this, but, uh, something that very few people know that Abraham Lincoln was actually a Republican. You remember when he was, he was pretty sure nobody knew that? Even though, you know, he was the first Republican president and really essentially one of the founders of the, party and uh everybody who went to school knows that i mean i think a lot of people who went to school probably know a little bit about the civil war and why it started too uh certainly there are many people out there interested in starting controversies about why the civil war started which is a little dumb but uh you know for instance most middle schoolers are are taught the, the basics of why the civil war started and and this historian that was being brought up in uh Allegedly, in the defense of the of Trump's statements, did say, "Well, uh, it is true that the Civil War could have been anticipated for some time, and that there was a scholarly movement to regard the Civil War as perhaps less inevitable as uh, than uh, than others might think." But it wasn't necessarily the case that. Uh, well, certainly isn't the case that Andrew Jackson, had he lived would absolutely have been able to avert the Civil War. Although it is interesting to note that, yeah, okay, well, he was, uh, he didn't entirely, he didn't just lose his pen after uh, leaving the presidency. He he did, in fact, uh, kind of state his strong support for unionism 
in the uh, in the national union sense uh, before he died because it was so hard to do those days after you had died and uh, I don't know it was it was it was an interesting insight but um, you know it's one thing to have to state in 1830 that in principle I'm a strong proponent of union but I also own slaves and I, and I really like it it's great to have slaves and uh you know but i guess the the thinking as well some historians say it is possible that perhaps as a uh, national leader who was willing to admit that he was conflicted he might have been able to uh talk some other kindred spirit southerners into avoiding the violence of the war i guess is what he's trying to say uh, it, 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 but it doesn't really hold up very well. And, uh, neither does the argument, uh, in total that, uh, that the president really had something of interest to say here. Uh, as a matter of fact, though, a lot of writing this morning and a lot of attention paid to it and therefore, uh, in my pocket about the, as they say, dizzying day of interviews. Politico has a piece up about, uh, the results of the day's round of interviews. And uh, I'm a little, I'm so, uh, so dizzying, in fact, that I'm a little confused as to when all of these interviews took place. It seems like a lot of them were taped for later broadcast over the weekend, and we got early views of them, early transcripts of what went on. And then uh, now, of course, the reporters having put these things out in their full form, uh, they believe that there's context missing. Uh, let me start, I guess. Well, let's let's look at that Politico piece uh, to give the overview of what's going on and, and, and where the press is on all this. Trump's dizzying day of interviews. Uh, comments on Civil War, big banks. Yes, before the day was over, we were talking about big banks. And, um, well, we weren't really talking about big banks. We were talking about the fact that Trump was saying the words big banks. Uh, he caused a small splash in the early to mid-afternoon, uh, allowing reporters to say that he was, uh, well, how did he put it? Let's see, is it in this uh, article? That he was looking at, you know, or giving serious consideration to uh, you know, some kind of action to break up the big banks. Uh, and the, the, the financial press, was excited about that. And I mean, in a negative way, they were exercised, I guess, about that. And uh, everyone began pointing at, oh, my God, look, at uh, the finance sector stocks are slipping in the wake of these comments. Um, others in the, uh, let's say, I don't know, the tangential finance related press, that was that, speaking here primarily of Bloomberg politics writers were sort of excited about this, you know, breaking the president is thinking about or looking at uh, breaking up big banks or strongly. I don't even remember what they, what quote they offered up about this. And maybe the, uh, the article will reveal some of that. But the, the spirit of the comment was that he was considering, you know, something about breaking up big banks. And there you go. Uh, there's the, there's the economic populist in him breaking through. But, uh, pretty quickly, I mean, really within minutes, a good part of the journalistic community and certainly uh, the majority of the online progressive community was reminding everybody, this is a guy, not only does he uh, usually adhere to the advice of the last person to speak with him before he goes public on anything, but uh, he also tends to, uh, he tends to go on record, tends to be willing to go on record saying he's looking at or strongly considering or definitely having a, a very strong interest in looking at whatever the last person suggested to him. Whoever's in front of him, you know, uh, suggests something outlandish, n maybe, uh, entirely mainstream, perhaps, uh, total pipe dream for, for this particular president. Doesn't matter. Uh, if he, if he thinks he can get you to shut up and go away, <laughs> really, or write something nice about him, he'll say, oh, we're definitely looking at that. And, and, and it's becoming a recognizable pattern. And so it was recognized. 
uh, several times in a row, which is what makes it a pattern in itself. And now the, the pattern of recognizing it is recognizable. That's how recognizable this whole thing is. John Dawsey, or Josh, Josh Dawsey, sorry, uh, is the writer on this Politico piece. Uh, President Donald Trump questioned why the Civil War, which erupted 150 years ago over slavery, needed to happen. And uh, I, I, by the way, I mean, if you really, really want to give the guy the benefit of the doubt, and I don't, but if you wanted to, I guess you could say, uh, well, it was uh, inartfully expressed, which is a problem if you're the president of the United States. Uh, but really, you know, I guess the question of, well, could they not have found some other way of working things out other than war? And very likely the answer is no. But are there other alternatives? Yes, sure. Uh, there were certainly there was always the possibility that uh, the entire South would surrender on the question of slavery without uh, without any further objection and, and simply abolish slavery and uh, offer up equal rights to citizens, uh, on, uh, well, to their to their black population as equal citizens, etc. Uh, but that seemed highly unlikely. On the other hand, I will say this: uh, I guess in in hindsight, for instance, uh, the question of well, could the Civil War have been avoided? Um, I guess if you look at it this way, and say, well. What were the odds, or what would be the odds now, let's say? I mean, 150 years later, when we're supposedly more uh, progressive and, and think of things very differently than they did back in that day, uh, what would you think the odds were of uh, two enormous groups of white people, essentially the whole white country, dividing into two camps and saying, uh, over this question of how we're going to treat black people. Uh, we should, we're going to have to settle this and we're going to have to do it with blood. You and me, other white people, we're all going to kill each other. We're actually going to, you know, resort to, to warfare, murder, however you want to put it, and settle this question once and for all of, of what to do, uh, with the black folks that you've enslaved or I guess on the other side that we've enslaved. Uh, and, uh, yeah, let, let's, let's take it out on one another. And decide what to do. That would be rather unlikely. I mean, convince me now that white people would kill one another in large numbers over a, a long period of time uh, to decide that question now seems a little bit ridiculous. I mean, it, war always seems a little bit ridiculous. But I mean, I guess the idea of you, you could have convinced me, I suppose, even on the eve of the Civil War, that... Uh, well, they're not going to go to war with one another. I mean, I, they're, even abolitionists are essentially, in some cases, still very much racist in their own right. They just don't think there should be slavery, but they don't necessarily think that black people ought to be treated as equals. Not all of them, certainly. And there were some who were in the forefront of the movement and, and I guess in many cases motivated on religious grounds who saw things quite differently, quite a lot more clearly, uh, but, you know, there were certainly some middle grounders there as well who, who simply said, well, you know, chattel slavery seems like uh, we might be outdated on that one, uh, but that doesn't mean we have to, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? I mean, it was just a little bit of wink, wink to it too, I'm sure, but yeah, the, the idea that, uh, you know, uh, the, the country would divide North against South and just have a bunch of white people fight it out as opposed to saying, you know, well, I, this doesn't seem like the sort of thing we do in this country. But, you know, there was a very, very weird <laughs> current for war at the time. And also, it's also not really all that easy to believe that a, a guy as militaristic as uh, as Andrew Jackson was would necessarily have been out front saying, yeah, you know, at all costs, we have to avoid war. It just, I mean, he, he, I don't know. By the time the Civil War actually rolled around, and remember he dies, what did, the, what did the president finally decide? 16 years before the outbreak of the Civil War, 
Uh, 16 years is plenty of time to come around to a slightly different, slightly more nuanced, and, and, and here we don't necessarily mean that nuance is a good thing, but a more nuanced view of things, like I'm a strong unionist. Yes, we absolutely need to work this out uh, as one nation. And that's the, the only crumb, as I understand it, that uh, Trump is able to cling to and Trump defenders are able to cling to in order to help make his comments make any sense. That that uh, Jackson was a a strong supporter of the union, and it's uh, let's see what what kind of word would we want to use? It's indivisibility. It's indissolubility. Is that a word? Uh, the uh, the idea here being that uh, whatever the cost, this would be settled as one nation, and at all costs had to be avoided. Uh, that it, it was to be avoided, that it be settled by civil war. However, I mean, over the course of 16 years, I don't necessarily know that, I mean, even, even if Jackson were to strongly adhere to the northern version of the Union cause, I think it would have been pretty easy to say of, uh, of northern partisans at the time, that they fully believed that they were uh, insisting on a unionist solution, I think, right? I mean, was that not the, the point? That uh, secession was unconstitutional and unfathomable, and despite the fact that they couldn't settle the question of slavery civilly, that didn't stop them from, A, marching to civil war, and B, uh, insisting that the war was thrust upon them by Southern intransigence and that they were fighting, you know, I mean, every, to this day, we, like, there's no question now, in addition to, to the, uh, uh, the understanding that the war was fought over slavery, there's the understanding that the war was fought by the North to impose its solution to the slavery question on the South and then reimpose Northern rule over the South and reintegrate them into the country. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know that that's necessarily inconsistent positions. I'm a strong unionist, but also very pro civil war. Of course, uh, they had a very different view of the Civil War in the rest of Tennessee, I guess. Apparently, they were interested in fighting the Civil War as a statement against Union. But hey, opinions differ. We'll just have to leave it there, I guess. I don't know. It's a very weird uh, situation. And uh, the more time spent trying to pretend that Trump knew what he was talking about the worse off we're going to be, I think. Let's see, a few comments coming in. Uh, Arliss Bunny, uh, who, by the way, I, I did get a comment in email the other day, actually through our Square Cash donation uh, program. Thanks very much to uh, all of you who have participated in that. And I got a nice comment that said, uh, I wanted to make a contribution. And can't we have Arliss Bunny on a little bit more often? So, uh, hey, if you're feeling up to it one of these days, Arliss, we'd love to have you back on our airwaves. Let's see. Uh, but uh, right now, we've got your comment. Trump doesn't have a good grip on what happened at, <laughs> at breakfast. That's probably true. Expecting otherwise is a waste of our collective time. Okay, well, I just wanted to... I, I thought we could probably put, say, 20 minutes into deciding that it was a waste of our collective time. And uh, and we have accomplished that. Michael Musson, because there has to be a 21st minute of this, says, I think the largest picture from what Trump says and the larger picture from what Trump says and does is that he's incredibly gullible. I, I, I think that that's, uh, largely true. Uh, essentially, I don't know. I think he just wanted to say whatever the hell he could to, to make it sound like he had given some thought to these things. The idea that, uh, that Trump knows anything about Andrew Jackson seems a little bit far fetched. Although I did read, uh, in this last day or so, that uh, apparently the weirdo white supremacist alt-right cuckoos who make up, I don't know what you would call them, but uh, the, the, at least some portion of Trump's supporters. And I guess here we're talking about the, the people who have this 
semi-clandestine white supremacist uh, agenda. I, I say semi-clandestine, and you know, others would consider that to be fairly open. Um, and I guess they would consider it to be fairly open if they were talking to other alt-right people. Oh, I'm, I'm absolutely open about it. And when they talk to mainstream media about it, they hide. But I guess uh, here we're talking about all the people who keep showing up at the White House with press passes and then posing at the podium, making the OK slash white power sign. And apparently that's a matter of some controversy. And pundits are arguing back and forth uh, about whether or not, oh, come on, there's simply the old OK symbol. It's just weird that they all make it with this menacing look on their face and everybody wants to have a picture making that that gesture. OK, sure, right, fine, whatever. Anyway, uh, I guess apparently among that crowd, there's special significance to Andrew Jackson. Probably, I mean, I don't really claim to understand it. This is really news to me, and, but it has the ring of truth to it. There's some there's some truthiness to it uh, for people who have come to understand of late that uh, Jackson's legacy is not one to be particularly proud of for precisely the same reasons that everybody has uh, been reconsidering the Jackson legacy and why, uh, for why in some cases, uh, Democratic Party organizations are renaming their traditional Jefferson Jackson dinners. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I don't find it surprising at all. If you told me, I'd be willing to believe that the alt-right folks believe that precisely because he's associated with genocide against Native Americans, that they think it's hilarious to be pro-Jackson, more or less out of the blue. At this stage, I mean, there's very little connection, I think, at this stage of the game to the Andrew Jackson legacy. He's not remembered in the same light as some of our better known presidents, some of whom had problems of their own, of course. Um, but all of a sudden, like this kick for Andrew Jackson, uh, it makes more sense to me as a clandestine or uh, a, a dog whistle, as people like to say, a dog whistle to the alt-right and white supremacists to uh, to adopt this outwardly you know, I guess to, uh, to, to conservative pundits, outwardly non-controversial interest in, if not adoration for, this one particular president. Hey, how can you fault somebody for having a favorite president? I mean, really, that, what's more patriotic than, than picking up on, uh, you know, a, a historical president and uh, and and saying oh, this one is my model, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, moving the uh, the portrait to a prominent place, uh, and and then pointing to reaction on the left and saying, "See, snowflakes, they're always upset about something. They're always looking for something." I just love Andrew Jackson because he's on the twenty dollar bill. Everyone knows Andrew Jackson. He's just a great. He was a general. He's on a $20 bill. What's the problem? If he was really so terrible, why is he on the $20 bill? We tried to remove him from the $20 bill, replace him with somebody else. You were having none of it. Not because I'm used to seeing his face on the $20 bill. No. There was more to it than, than just that. Anyway, so if that's true, uh, and, and it feels a lot like it is, like the okay sign, they, they're always, it seems, picking something that's defensible on purely uh surface level like this. how can you how can you get upset with me for using an okay sign how can you get upset with me for approving of a old time president right apparently the uh the idea is that it's some sort of wink and nod to the alt right and I, I guess the alternative explanation is even less likely the alternative explanation is that all of a sudden uh donald trump developed a an abiding interest in historical biography and has learned all about Andrew Jackson and despite his many issues and contradictions has decided that this is a historical model in some sense that he'd like to follow it will be very troubling in its own right but if he you know I'm sure that a person who wanted to do that 
who is intelligent would then be able to come up with explanations. Wow, these are the parts of the legacy I actually endorse. Whereas these other parts, no, no, I, I, uh, I disclaim those entirely. And whether or not that's a sensible position to take, I don't know, but you've certainly seen people take it. Wouldn't be very much of a surprise at that point. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Greg has sent me a piece here in Politico. Uh, again, Politico, damn you. Matthew Nussbaum, historians see a dark underside to Trump's Civil War riff. And it was a riff, and I, I suppose we probably don't need to spend that much more time on it, but uh, there are some puzzling nuances. President Donald Trump on Monday once again defied the history books, this time claiming that Andrew Jackson was, quote, really angry about the Civil War, despite having died 16 years before the first shots were fired, and puzzled why a deal wasn't cut to avoid the war altogether. Of course, I mean, actually, this is another weird thing. Like, but between him saying nobody ever asks why we had a civil war, everybody asks why we have it. That was it's literally the first question on the unit on the civil war in almost any schooling situation. Why are we having this war? Why did it happen? What are the causes of war? The underlying root causes. I mean, you know. That's that's the whole point of studying it. But no one ever asks. Also, of course, somebody has also pointed out to me, well, you know, th it is true that regionally you can sometimes learn very different things about the Civil War. But we know what region he's from. What do you think he learned in military school in New York about the Civil War? I think it's pretty, pretty likely that they gave him yeah, the traditional northern view of the war, that it was about slavery and that it was inevitable and that uh, the north kicked the crap out of the south because they, they would add that last bit because it's a military school. War is fantastic. It's why you're going to school. I doubt very much that he got any kind of sensitive, nuanced, southern-tinged view of the war, but maybe he had a southern general for a teacher. I don't know. I really doubt it. Anyway... Uh, it goes on here in this article, this second political article, to say he was really angry. This is the quote. He was really angry with what he saw with regard to the Civil War, which would have been nothing, but the preludes to the Civil War, certainly. And uh, as the historians were trying to fill in some kind of nuanced context, they would be talking about nullification uh, activity and, and would have been, I suppose, quite upset about that. And I guess he was actually on the record about that which is nice. It would be good to look at the record. He was really angry with what he regarded with what he saw with regard to the Civil War. There's no reason for this. Trump said in a radio interview with conservative writer Selena Zito broadcast Monday. There we go. Now we got the time uh, line set on that one. The Civil War, if you think about it, why? <laughs> if you if you think about it, people don't ask the question, but why was there a Civil War? Everyone asks the question. Why could that one not have been worked out, Trump added? Uh, well, of course, part of the reason, if you really care for the nuanced uh, view of the historical context of the Civil War and what Andrew Jackson may or may not have known about it before he died, uh, the difficulty was in swallowing all the deals that got made. Why couldn't a deal have been worked out? Well, a deal was worked out in, uh, in the 1820s for the admission to the Union of of Maine, hi Bill, and Missouri, uh, the ver and and the compromise of 1850, by which time, of course, Andrew Jackson was already dead. But uh, there were a series of compromises beginning in the at the founding with the the so what was supposed to be the gradual phasing out of slavery, the three fifths compromise. It's all deal making, and and still, you know, we end up. No, I, what he's trying to say is uh, Andrew Jackson and or Donald Trump would have been able to make the deal. But uh, believe it or not, he didn't have the confidence to, some, to just simply come out and say that. Uh, he was being humble. Trump for months has riled up history buffs with a range of eyebrow-raising comments, including his claim that not many people knew Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, his apparent ignorance that famed abolitionist Frederick Douglass died many years ago, and his question about whether anyone had heard of Susan B. Anthony. Anybody? Yeah. And the fact that he didn't seem to be aware of the extensive literature about the cause of the Civil War is now added to the list. It's probably the most hotly debated issue in American history, 
said historian Charles B. Dew, a professor at Williams College who wrote a landmark 2001 book, Apostles of Disunion, on the causes of the war. The president's comments on Monday struck some historians as darker than a history goof, with the president seeming to minimize the painful history of slavery in the United States uh, and the murder of Indians. But and uh, also talk up Jackson's role as a strong man leader who proudly owned many slaves. Yeah, it's the kind of comment that will get applause from neo-Confederate circles in the South, said Douglas Brinkley, a presidential historian at Rice University. Confederate flags were a common sight at Trump rallies during the 2016 campaign and monuments to Confederate leaders are common in southern states. Some in Trump's circle, including chief strategist Steve Bannon, have sought to liken Trump to Jackson, a populist. In March, Trump visited Jackson's gravesite in Nashville, Tennessee, where he declared himself a fan, uh, which, you know, I guess is troubling in its own right, uh, but uh, is additionally so because that's the only word he could think of. I'm a hey, Andrew Jackson, big fan. Loved your work on the 20. Terrific. You know, what are you a fan of? Steve Bannon, there we go, has made Jackson the epitome of the hard scrabble American folk hero, added Brinkley. And Trump has bought into Steve Bannon's version of Andrew Jackson. There's the answer. On Monday night, the president tweeted, he wanted to clarify everything. I shared that tweet with you in the morning post. President Andrew Jackson, who died 16 years before the Civil War started, just so you know, saw it coming and was angry. I'm so angry. This is actually uh, reminds me of a, a, a weird Arnold Schwarzenegger quote, an interview with Howard Stern upon the release of Jingle All the Way. <laughs> uh, anyway, a uh, very strange uh, memory to have it brought back. But uh, for some reason, that stuck with me. And it was the Arnold Schwarzenegger accent. Uh, by the way, just, uh, just to fill in this thought, this was. Uh, Howard Stern interviewing him about his new movie, which is as crappy as any of the other movies he made. But, you know, he, Arnold Schwarzenegger never lacked for enthusiasm about his own films. It's good at PR. It wasn't very convincing, but he did say the words. Uh, but <laughs> I remember him being asked, you know, what do you, basically, you know, what do you think people are going to think of this movie? What, when people go to see it, what's going to be their reaction? <laughs> yeah, the only thing Schwarzenegger could come up with was that they would be angry, which was weird. And of course he said, it would be so angry. So angry. Why would they be so angry about having watched Jingle All the Way? Are they mad? They want their money back? When, no, they'd be so angry because they would do such a, it was such a terrific movie. They'd enjoy themselves so much. They would want to go in line and see it again. But everyone will be watching the, the movie and so there's no tickets available. And so so they're so angry that they don't get a chance to see it again. That, that was like, you're legitimately saying that's going to be the response to Jingle all the way. Uh, which, you know, all by itself, even without their anger, was a ridiculous thing to say. Uh, I believe President Andrew Jackson also said the same thing about not only Jingle all the way, but Kindergarten Cop, which I thought was really controversial of him to say because it's a far better picture. Anyway... Uh, on Monday night, the president tweeted that uh, President Andrew Jackson would have been so angry and uh, he would never have let it happen, the Civil War, which he would have done by probably, I don't know what, frightening everybody with his with his hair and saying, look at me, this could happen to you if you have a civil I don't know what he would have done to convince people not to have a Civil War. Jackson, who was a slaveholder, threatened to use federal military force against South Carolina, when the state sought to nullify federal tariffs. He died in 1845, 16 years before the Civil War erupted at Fort Sumter, which, by the way, is in South Carolina. What I saw in that comment was his belief, his attraction to a kind of strongman history, said David Blight, a Civil War historian at Yale University. It's so completely out of any knowledge or context to suggest that somehow Jackson would have headed off the Civil War. Yeah, I think that's what most people feel. The broad consensus among historians is that the secession of 11 southern states and the resulting war was driven by slavery and the racial order that slavery represented. The Confederacy's vice president, Alexander H. Stevens, said himself that the South's foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, 
is his natural and moral condition. And boy, do they love bringing that stuff up again these days with a little OK sign at the White House press uh, room podium. Uh, by the way, just as a short aside here, uh, I, I note in passing that uh, there was uh, 11 southern states seceding. We have 50 at the moment. Um, 50 states minus 11 would be 39, right? And it just occurred to me, have you been watching? Because you likely have been seeing the uh, the same stuff on your Twitter feed. Let me look this up to see if I, I have this correct. Uh, but Chris Hayes, the other day, was going on at some length. He was, for some reason, very puzzled by, or, or very intrigued by, uh, I have to look this up in Twitter advanced search. He was intrigued by the use of a very strange uh, flag motif uh, that uh, was being used in emails and other uh, online publications by the Trump White House. Let's see. i got to use uh, search Chris uh, and his uh, account here. Nothing came up with this one, huh? Hmm. Uh, maybe I have this account wrong. Anyway, uh, he was very interested in this repeated use of this strange flag motif that only had 39 stars on it. And, uh, yeah, here we are. Uh, other people talking and tweeting about it, too. Uh, here's Christina Wilkie pointing it out back on April 26th. On it, Last seen, I guess, on an email uh, urging people to wish a happy birthday to First Lady Melania Trump on the 26th. Happy birthday to our First Lady Melania. And then this little flag motif, and it has 39 stars on it. And Chris Hayes was super intrigued by how this mistake kept being made because uh, they use this in a lot of their emails. And he was pointing out there's never been a U.S. flag, official U.S. flag with 39 stars on it because the uh, 39th and 40th states were admitted to the Union together. We went from a 38-star flag to a 40-star flag very quickly. But uh, I wonder if it's, uh, I, you know, I think it's just a graphic designer, you know, put together a flag thing and was like, man, that field is super crowded at this resolution to put that 50 stars on that field is going to make the flag look funny. This no one's going to count the stars. And even if they do, so what? Uh, and maybe they came up with it that way. But wouldn't it be something, you know, the the dedication to weirdo symbolism among these alt writers wouldn't that be something if the 39 star thing was like wink, wink, nod, a nudge, nudge, uh, the union minus the 11 Confederate states? Oh, a, a neo Confederate, uh, dog whistle. I don't think so, but I don't know. At this point, I guess I shouldn't put anything past them. We could probably superimpose that reasoning on it, uh, after the fact and, and see if anybody buys into it. Uh, but if they do, you didn't hear it here. It was not, not my responsibility. I'm not giving them anything else to go with. All right. I find that very strange. Okay, so back to the article that uh, Greg had shared with us, the historians seeing this dark underside to Trump's comments. The uh, The myth that the Civil War was fought over not slavery, but states' rights has become an article of faith for some in the South and those in the white supremacist movement. Some southern states instituted Robert E. Lee Day, celebrating the Confederate general to fall on the same day as Martin Luther King Jr. Day after Congress established the holiday in 1983. To have the occupant of the Oval Office cast doubt on the historical consensus could hearten those who downplay the significance that racism had in driving the war, historians said. On Monday, as controversy swirled around Trump's remarks, the white supremacist and outspoken Trump supporter David Duke was tweeting about efforts by the Democratic mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu, to remove a Confederate monument. Confederate heritage, Duke wrote, is American heritage. Democrats were quick to call out Trump for his remarks. President Trump doesn't understand why there was a civil war. 
It's because my ancestors and millions of others were enslaved, wrote Representative Barbara Lee of California on Twitter. Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey simply tweeted a quote from the writer James Baldwin. Ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. And so ends this particular piece. By the way, did you read anything about what that Confederate monument in New Orleans was about? There's, I mean, there was an inscription on it that's like uh, pretty much, I mean, I, I don't know pretty much. It is. It's an, it's an overt statement of white supremacy. It's not anything that belongs anywhere in public. And I suppose if you want to, if you want to work out a deal, whatever, I mean, sandblast that crap off of the, or whatever it is, the plaque, I don't know. Cover that, get rid of that, and I guess you could possibly, maybe, talk some people into keeping the rest of the monument. But honestly, this day and age, Confederate monument, I mean, once you start taking the words off of it, go ahead, take it down. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if there's anybody that would accept that as a compromise. I don't know if it's necessary as a compromise. I don't know. I'm not from New Orleans. I don't have any of the uh, local history or context in mind when I say something like this. Don't listen to me, but I didn't want to bring up. If you didn't see it, you should see what was what was inscribed on that monument. There would be no question in your mind. You'd have to be nuts, and David Duke is nuts, to to stand there in defense of that particular monument. I suppose you could make a case about one that has uh, less verbiage and and or, or that's maybe even more abstract, like a simple obelisk that says, uh, you know, to the many Americans who died. Okay. Even though many of them, you know, were fighting to not be Americans. But okay. Uh, we'll leave that aside. Let's see. Um, so it wasn't all just about the Civil War. That's that's for sure. But I guess before we leave the Civil War topic, I will bring up this piece in the Hill. I guess it was supposed to be offered up as defense, just to give a little more detail to what our defenders are actually trying to say here. Joe Concha is the writer. Who is Joe Concha? I don't know. Let's see if there's anything down at the bottom that will tell me something about it. Uh, he's a media reporter for the Hill. Okay, so now he's writing an opinion piece because I guess he's an amateur historian as well as being a media reporter for The Hill. Uh, Entirely possible. You know, maybe he's made a concerted study of this. But he says, this this is an interesting angle on things. Distortion of Trump's Civil War comments is reason few Americans trust the media. Hmm, that is interesting, isn't it? There are many Americans who truly believe the media is the opposition party to the Trump administration. Now, you're in the media. Are you? Is, do you believe that? It's an interesting question. If another example is needed to make that point, look no further than the shameful slash shameless <laughs> what coverage of President Trump's Civil War controversy on Monday. First, a quick review. Trump sat down with Washington Examiner's Selena Zito for an interview airing on Sirius XM on Monday afternoon. At one point, the discussion turns to the Civil War with the exact exchange looking like this after Zito broached Trump's recent visit to the Hermitage, the the home of the late President Andrew Jackson in Tennessee. Late? Do we still say he's late? I mean, late as dead, yes, but how late? I Uh, I thought that meant recently departed. I mean, had Andrew Jackson been a little later, Jackson was the president from 1828 to 1837, while the Civil War began in 1861, it helpfully notes in brackets, you wouldn't have had the Civil War. That's a pretty broad statement right there and probably wrong. He was a very tough person, but he had a big heart, Trump said. What? He was really angry that he saw what was happening. Well, I guess he wasn't angry that he saw it, but he did see it and that made him angry. He was really angry that he saw what was happening with regard to the Civil War. He said, there's no reason for this. People don't realize, you know, the Civil War, if you think about it. Why? Trump asked. People don't ask that question. You all you all remember that. Now, one can easily argue against Trump's point that Jackson, a slaveholder, could have somehow been able to convince the South to end slavery through negotiation instead of war. But as usual, the media's eyes are bigger than its stomach when it comes to twisting narratives around Trump with a reflex to the extreme negative. That is a flourish you did not need. As a result, we get these kinds of headlines. USA Today, note to President Trump, Andrew Jackson wasn't alive for the Civil War. Salon, Donald Trump doesn't understand why the Civil War couldn't have been worked out. 
Slate, which said Trump wishes a slaveholder could have come in and resolved the whole Civil War thing before it started. CNN went with Donald Trump just gave two incredibly bizarre and fact-free interviews. That doesn't really have anything to do with the Civil War. Twitter's moments description, Trump proposes an alternate history where the Civil War was avoided. And he did. So, whatever. One part of Trump's alternate history that is being mocked the most is the fact that Jackson died in 1845 and the war didn't begin until 1861. Therefore, how could Jackson be, quote, really angry about a war that was 16 years away? But as historians will tell you, maybe, there had been perpetual tension between the North and South over slavery since the nation was founded in 1776. Pause here to say... That's probably why people regarded the war as inevitable and the idea that Andrew Jackson would have stopped it rather ridiculous. But we'll continue with his writing. The Civil War didn't just happen overnight. Several compromises were made on the way to 1861, most notably the Missouri Compromise in 1820 and the Compromise of 1850, which we'll pause again to say uh, is probably part of the reason that people think that no deal could have been cut that would have avoided the war because people spent all the time from, well, let's say 1787 forward trying to cut just such a deal and it led to the war anyway and it didn't really do much to resolve the situation. Now, per the online Civil War Academy, I don't know what that is, but apparently he's decided to quote it. It says this, Blood was on the minds of many of the citizens of America over the entire slave issue. On March 3rd, 1820, both Missouri and the free state of Maine were admitted into the Union. The balance was kept with one being free and one slave. The writing was on the wall with the inevitability of the war. And then for some reason he embeds the tweet of Selena Zito reading, Context is everything. Without it, it's a lie. Which is a hell of a thing for somebody from a place like that to say, but she said it. Uh, The article continues. And then there's the 2003 book, This Terrible War, The Civil War and Its Aftermath, written by three university history professors who concluded the Civil War was not inevitable. And I guess it's easy enough to say, well, anything could be regarded as not inevitable. Everybody could have died some other way. Giant meteor. It wasn't inevitable. Other ways to settle things? I guess. It just seems awfully unlikely. But let's take a look here. Dale Bright, a Yale history professor uh, and director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery and Abolition, wrote this in a Washington Post op-ed titled, Could the War Have Been Prevented in 2010? Now, just a second here. Dale Bright. Uh, What was the name of the Yale professor that we just heard about in the piece that Greg sent. Uh, I got to scroll through this. Yeah. So, okay, that's different. He's David Blight, a Civil War historian at Yale University. Now uh, we're, <laughs> we're reading about Dale Bright, a Yale history professor. So the, the Bright Blight controversy rages on. They must be having fist fights. They're caning one another over at Yale University. Uh, This time, though, Dale Bright says in his Washington Post op-ed in 2010, could the war have been prevented? In the early to mid-20th century, a generation or two of American historians argued that the Civil War was avoidable, indeed a needless war, wrought by mere politics and the unctuous fury of power-hungry politicians, Bright wrote. Now, that's interesting to note in today's context. Yes, I believe Andrew Jackson could have helped us avoid the war because he was such a strong guy. I'm going to be similarly strong and avoid the war because, you know, not everyone thinks it was an inevitability. As a matter of fact, there's pretty good scholarship going on at Yale University that argues that the war was avoidable and it only happened because of politics and unctuous fury of power-hungry politicians, which is totally not happening here right now among us. Hmm. Anyway, Bright continues, but that was before, in the wake of World War II, that a new generation of scholars came to see just how fundamental slavery and race were in the story of the 1850s and in the decisions that led to the firing on Fort Sumter in April 1861. 
In the abstract, we might never stop wondering about how the war could have been avoided, as we must also we must also explain why it was not. Uh, now, taken together, that entire quote, not particularly convincing for the idea that, yeah, the war could have been avoided and Andrew Jackson was just the guy to do it, or Donald Trump. Following Trump's comments, the New York Times decided to fact-check the president with the help of widely respected historian John Meacham, who is the one who I've been seeing all over television saying, yeah, the president uh, is living in a snowstorm of facts, right? Here's a key takeaway around Trump's comment that many in media are mocking around Jackson being really angry that he saw what was happening with regard to the Civil War years before it broke out. Meacham said he thought that Mr. Trump may have been referring to the nullification crisis, which did occur during Jackson's lifetime, the Times reported, or at least that's what Meacham came up with. If I'm trying to make any sense out of this whatsoever. Maybe he was talking about nullification, which I wrote about in my book, but there's no chance that Trump read that. Anyway, the crisis, which began in 1832, was a conflict between the federal government and South Carolina, a southern state that would later be instrumental in the movement for secession. During the crisis, President Jackson took a firm stand on the side of the Union, Meacham said. They are two stray Trumpian ideas that collided into each other when he talked. Now, remember, this is being offered in a defense of Trump's statement. Okay. So according to Meacham, a slave owner like Jackson was aligned with the North on some sticking points. Some sticking points. This is a nice way of putting it. And may have been in a position to negotiate. Trump's problem then becomes, as Meacham points out, is explaining what a negotiation would mean in terms of abolishing slavery. Again, it's easy to poke holes in Trump's argument. His points are often inelegant and not perfectly stated. That's who he is, which is to say he can't make a coherent point, and so we should stop talking about it. But let's not pretend he's the first ever to ask the question around the U.S. Civil War being something that could have been settled peacefully. (laughs) <laughs> which is exactly what Donald Trump did with his statements. That's what makes it so troubling. Now the whole, you, uh, I, th- I hope you're a, an opponent of nullification here, Mr. Concha, but your entire piece has just been nullified by the the last paragraph. This is supposed to be this big summation where we all agree with you and your argument. Let's not pretend he's the first ever to ask the question around the U.S. Civil War being something that could have been settled peacefully. But because it's Trump, this will be made in today's, into today's crisis, at least until another one is created tomorrow, in the name of hysterical hyperbole. Okay, well, I got to tell you, you know, you do yourself no favors by, by winding up this way. Let's not pretend that he's the first ever to ask this question. Let's, in fact, pretend that millions of people have asked this question before and since. And let's look to see whether there's any evidence of that. Oh, yes, every history class ever taught in the United States does, in fact, begin with this question. Golly gee, every textbook. So why was, what are the underlying causes? Why did this happen? Was it inevitable? Everyone asks this. But let's not pretend what Donald Trump pretends, which is that he's the only one who ever asked it before. He actually literally says that people don't ask it, and he's the only one that does. Uh, presumably because he's uh, people don't ask it, but I'm asking it, so I must be the first one or nearly the first, or I'm the only person on the planet. You tell me which interpretation makes more sense, Joe. I don't know. I mean, okay. That's another 20, 30 minutes gone on the question of whether or not Donald Trump is an ignoramus, but I think we're getting it. Okay. Let's see what other comments have come in since. Uh... Kate Sherrill saying, uh, here's one historian here, I guess in Salon magazine. Uh, it's pretty much inevitable that Trump will try to stage a coup and overthrow democracy. Oh, another inevitability. I knew it. Uh, by the way, I have a nice private message here from Greg Dworkin, uh, who's uh, with a description of Joe Concha. Uh, I guess a pro- would you call this a professional description? He's a conservative a-hole know nothing. So I don't know. I mean, I don't think you can get a job doing that, but, you know, uh, I I consider you to be a professional, so it was a professional description after all. Let's see. Uh, A few other things here. Oh, yes, okay, we'll set that story aside, but uh, we need to spend a day on this other thing. Thank you, Kate, for uh, sending this other story along. Let's see. Um, Hmm. Anything else relevant to the rest of this? Uh, Serena 
uh, uh, Peace Arena uh, is how you do. Serena Blaze, B-L-A-I-Z. I had to open up your profile because the type's too small. I'm like, B-L-A-L-Z? That can't, how am I going to pronounce that? That can't be right. I bet that's an I. And it is. Blaze. Serena Blaze, Peace Arena on Twitter. Wondering whether it's time for a march for history. And I think we may be right. Oh, hat tip to Joe Maynard on that one. Okay. And uh, let's see. Trump was no doubt recounting something someone told him about Jackson, says Michael Musson. He didn't think about it, so further analysis is moot. Damn, I should have read that one 34 minutes ago, uh, because I think that's largely true. Uh, there's just not much point anymore. Let's see. Uh, however, a broader point on Trump's dizzying day of interviews is probably worth reading into. Again, Josh Dawsey, just to remind you, writing in Politico, uh, there was, of course, the Civil War comments. Uh, but then he goes on and interviews on other subjects with other interviewers and says, for instance, he would have been on, he would be honored, honored to meet with Kim Jong Un, the violent North Korean dictator who is developing nuclear missiles and oppresses his people under the right circumstances. That is to say, and that's a weirdly constructed sentence. He would be honored to meet with him under the right circumstances. Not that he is developing nuclear missiles and oppressing his people under the right circumstances. There's a comma in there, and it it helps delineate things, but I thought I might as well clarify. Uh, and as somebody else uh, put it, uh, you know, it's really rather remarkable to see him ping pong back and forth inside of a week from I might start a nuclear war with Kim Jong-un, but I also might be honored to meet with him under the right circumstances, which, of course, I mean, you know, at this point, he can claim, yeah, if he's in shackles, I would be honored to meet with him. But seems like an inartful expression, again, of whatever thought it might be that was rattling around in his head under all that hair. The president floated and then backed away from a tax on gasoline as well. What do you know? I'm looking at that. Oh, uh, that would be suicidal. Don't want to do that. I'm, I'm looking at it. I've looked at it and I did not like the look of it. And I'm done now. I'm done. I'm finished looking at it. Burn me a steak. Trump said he was looking at breaking up the big banks, sending the stock market sliding. He seemed to praise Philippines strongman President Rodrigo Duterte for his high approval ratings. He promised changes to the Republican health care bill, though he has seemed unsure what was in the legislation, even as his advisors whipped votes for it. And even, by the way, as the whips on Capitol Hill refused to tell anybody how they were voting. This is... This is a bill, once again, in some tremendous trouble. Keep your fingers crossed and keep calling your representatives. And Monday still had nine hours to go at this point, we are told. It seems to be among the most bizarre recent 24 hours in American presidential history, said Douglas Brinkley, a presidential historian. It was all just surreal disarray and a confused mental state from the president. 25th Amendment. Just saying. The interviews published by Bloomberg, Face the Nation, and Sirius XM Radio Network seemed timed to the president's 100-day mark, but contained a dizzying amount of news, even for a president who often makes news in stream-of-consciousness comments. I should be president. Trump's advisors have at times tried to curb his media appearances, worried he will step on his message, or his tie, possibly. They were not helpful to us one senior administration official said there was no point to do all of them. There's no point in doing any of them, I assure you. The White House, of, oh, uh, generically speaking, White House officials said privately there was no broader strategy behind the interviews. GOP strategists and Capitol Hill aides were puzzled by it all. I have no idea what they view as a successful media hit, said one senior GOP consultant with close ties to the administration. He just seemed to go crazy today, a senior GOP aide said. Hooray. Trump's comments questioning the need for the Civil War, aired Monday afternoon, seemed to disregard history and downplay slavery, several historians said. Why couldn't that one have been worked out? Of course, still my favorite part of that one. The Civil War was largely fought over slavery and its expansion, with southern states saying they had a right to have slaves and secede from the Union. Trump has been compared to Jackson, most prominently by Stephen Bannon. I guess, again, just reinforcing that, answering my question. 
his chief strategist. Trump again praised Jackson on Twitter Monday night before uh, saying he saw the war coming, but Jackson died years earlier. He just wanted us to know that. White supremacists, lost causers, states' rights activists could latch on to this. Said who? David Blight, Civil War historian at Yale University. We heard of him, right? I don't know if Trump even knows he's doing it. You can be too ignorant to know you're ignorant. <laughs> well done there, sir. Trump broke with longstanding precedent by telling Bloomberg he would consider a meeting with the North Korean president. The United States has no ties with North Korea, and the country has repeatedly tried to fire missiles and build up a stockpile to harm the United States. Recently, the country posted video of the country sending a missile into the White House, blowing it up. It was fake. Don't worry. Later in the day, Trump said, none of us are safe, mentioning North Korea. Spicer defended the president's words. Be Sean Spicer is even mentioned in the story so far. They usually say that ahead of time. But Sean Spicer defended the president's words, crediting the dictator, that is the North Korean one, not the American one, for assuming power at an early age. And he led his country forward. You remember this? this I think this happened. Was this in one of these interviews, too? We got a lot of advance notice of what was coming in these interviews. He did uh, at some point over the weekend, I read, he said, said something like, yeah, you know, you got to give uh, this Kim Jong-un a lot of credit. After all, he's a young man, 27 years old, to come in and take over a country and lead it forward. I mean, not everybody could do that. You got to give him some credit. And uh, I mean, OK, it's a dictatorship. And uh, gee whiz, uh, I'm not certain that there was a whole lot of choice. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the great tweets I saw about it from Josh Greenman, <laughs> immediate reaction. He was literally the only one allowed to take over the country. It's not like a great achievement or that he convinced people. Yeah, he's only 27, but he's really skilled as a dictator. We should use him after we should elevate this guy to, to the job. It was, it was handed to him. And if you, if you said you thought someone else should be the dictator of North Korea, you would get killed. So I don't know. Yeah, none of us are safe. <laughs> ah, he's dumb. Other advisors said the meeting would only happen if the president changed his ways. That is, again, the, the North Koreans, I guess. An unlikely scenario. And noted that Trump has criticized the North Korean leader. <laughs> he has, hasn't he? But Spicer's comments, maybe they do mean the, our president changing his ways. But Spicer's comments uh, struck many as almost praising the North Korean president. I would not say Kim the third, are we referring to him this way now, has moved the country forward. Jay Nordlinger, an editor at the Conservative National Review, wrote on Twitter, why is the presidential spokesman talking like this? Are we in America? Uh, maybe. Trump's comments on the big banks to Bloomberg would be favored by Democrats and seemed to take Wall Street officials by surprise. Stock markets immediately slid. Several people close to Trump noted he often uses the phrase looking at when asked about a position where he's unfamiliar or doesn't have a definitive answer that he wants to give. Spicer <clears throat> later declined to say Trump would do it. Trump also said, um, told Bloomberg, rather, <clears throat> that he would consider a gas tax, a policy proposal often favored by Democrats. That drew fire from conservative groups more aligned with his agenda, like Club for Growth. The idea even seemed to take Democrats by surprise with Senator Charles Schumer, the minority leader, declining to comment. A senior administration official said the idea of a gas tax had not seriously been proposed by anyone in the White House, just just the president. He did not express support, Spicer said later, adding he was only considering the idea because industry executives asked him to do so. Really? Trump surprised senior Hill Republicans later Monday by also telling Bloomberg that his proposed health law was likely to change even as his advisors furiously tried to get votes for the current bill. Some wondered if he was just referring to the bill changing in the Senate, which is widely expected, if it passes the House. Two senior administration officials said there were no big chances coming to the House of Representatives, changes rather, coming to the House of Representatives text and that they weren't exactly sure what he was saying. Republican legislators were still seeking guidance from the White House, amazingly enough, Monday night. 
officials said. He also laud- lauded Duterte, the leader in the Philippines, who is notorious for ruling with an iron fist, for being popular. Trump has often praised other rulers who are strong and have high approval ratings, using famous and strong as high compliments, as opposed to being, you know, third grade rhetoric. You know he's very popular in the Philippines, Trump said of Duterte, who he praised for getting rid of drugs by murdering people who use drugs, of course. Duterte's method for cracking down on drugs, which have included condoning of extrajudicial killings, have drawn scorn from human rights groups and other observers of his record, like the rest of the world. Good news for all you opioids-addicted, suffering uh, folks out in Trump country. The plan to address your addiction is finally here. Invite the guy who murders drug addicts to the White House for some pointers. The comments took politicians of both parties and some of his aides by surprise. They came after Trump had earlier surprised foreign policy experts with a very friendly conversation with Duterte on Saturday night and an invitation to visit the White House. Duterte has not accepted and said he might be too busy to come. Quite a move. I like that one. This is a man who has boasted publicly about killing his own citizens, said Ben Cardin, a Democrat, The United States is unique in the world because our values, respect for human rights, respect for the rule of law, are our interests. Ignoring human rights will not advance U.S. interests in the Philippines or any place else, just the opposite. Well, we could debate on that question for some time. I think we know what Ben Cardin meant, even if it wasn't exactly right, but... Uh, certainly it's a good starting point, at least for saying, well, we ought not perhaps to be inviting Duterte to the White House. Although, it, I don't know, I mean, that would be an interesting way of, of, of approaching it and saying, uh, if, if I believe for a minute that Trump was inviting him to the White House to highlight uh, United States failures to stand for human rights consistently in every situation across the globe and that we took responsibility for it and uh, we were willing to take our lumps for it, uh, I guess that would be interesting. But that's not something Donald Trump or really any other president is is likely to say. And uh, a president who might be likely to say so would not punctuate it with an invitation to Duterte. So I, I imagine that's just that we can just leave that aside. Spicer was asked if Trump was briefed on Duterte's human rights record. The president gets fully briefed, he said, not elaborating. Sure. Why not? He, you know, he's so fully briefed. He's the most fully, I'm the most fully briefed guy you ever heard. Uh, just take a look at me. I'm, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, would you like to see my briefs? I, I should show you. I wouldn't mind. Uh, you're an attractive young lady. I'd like to show you my briefs. I'm, I'm sure that would probably come out in the right context. Anyway. Finally, Trump's mantra of never retreat, never surrender was revived by John Dickerson of Face the Nation, who asked if the president stood by his claims that Obama was a bad or sick guy, as he tweeted, for allegedly tapping his phones in Trump Tower. That claim is unsubstantiated and even more to the point. Dickerson says, uh, you know, basically puts it out there that, uh, you know, no, not only is it not of it wasn't Dickerson that even put it out there. He did uh, mention that it was unsubstantiated, I think. But Trump took the opposite tack and, and said they've been very highly proven or what was it? Proven very strongly, very strong, very popular in the way they were proven. Uh, but then how about this line? I don't think he meant this one. This might just be a verbal slip, but he's uh, susceptible to such slips. I don't stand by anything. <laughs> Do you stand by your claim that Obama was a bad or sick? I don't stand by anything. Yeah, we know that. I don't stand by anything Trump said before adding, I think our side's been proven very strongly. Wrong, but he left that part out. Later, Spicer said Trump fully understood, I'm sorry, fully stood by his comments in Obama, even though he doesn't stand by. I don't stand by anything. Do you stand by those comments? I don't stand by anything. Uh, Okay, Spicer, did he stand by those comments? He did. Okay. Pushed by Dickerson, Trump ended up walking away, ending the interview and going back to his desk, which was right next to him. He didn't have to walk very far. Okay, it's enough, he said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you actually saw the video footage, it, what, that was the most amazing uh, excerpt from any of the interviews, essentially. That once he was finally asked a tough question, and it wasn't a tough question, it was just one he didn't want to answer. 
And then he gets all upset and ends the interview on video, which is pretty amazing. That will air. We have seen it. You can't hide from that one. All right. Moving right along, perhaps, maybe, uh, considering the pace of the show. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, other things that need to be put on record for the day. Let's see. Uh, Man, tomorrow is Wednesday, and of course we'll have Joan McCarter with us as well as Greg Dworkin, and I'm sure we will speak extensively of the current status of the health care bill, but we might as well begin setting the table on this. Plus, of course, the bill that uh, will keep the government running through the end of the fiscal year. Last week, you'll recall that they passed a one-week continuing resolution, and now it appears that they will pass another continuing resolution that will take uh, appropriations through the end of the fiscal year, which is to be expected. But what was not necessarily expected was the extent to which Democrats could be said to have gotten their way on so many issues addressed by the bill. Let's pick this one up here. There's a couple of of good ones uh, that... Uh, I have available here um, on the spending bill. Let's see. Roll call is closest at hand here. And uh, we'll bring this one up. Uh, our writer here, uh, Niels Lesniewski, uh, over at Roll Call. Uh, how the omnibus, that is to say the continuing resolution, became a Democratic wish list. Pelosi and Schumer... Uh, It says here, maximize the leverage of the minority and their votes. By the way, in case you were ever wondering, omnibus, like how that comes to be used so often or what that term is all about. uh, Ordinarily, our appropriations bills are done in 12 separate bills. Uh, It's been a million years since anybody ever actually passed all 12 successfully individually, but... uh, you know, they, they usually uh, at least mark up the bills in the appropriations committees separately because each, uh, each of the subcommittees of the appropriations committee handles one such bill and very little else. I mean, this is, these are enormous bills, but, uh, you focus on whichever department or collection of departments it is that you appropriate for and almost nothing else and produce one of the 12 bills that altogether fund all government operations. Uh, very often the 12 bills are not individually passed freestanding on the floor of either chamber. And so we run out, end up running out of time and they combine several bills together and that becomes the omnibus spending bill. So likewise here, this is, this really is just another continuing resolution, although they do make enough changes. Uh, I, I guess, uh, hmm. Continuing resolutions usually uh, uh, simply say, well, a clean CR, a clean continuing resolution simply usually means that they continue the current spending levels without change, but just as frequently they pass continuing resolutions that are not clean in that sense. They make specific changes to spending levels either up or down, but they're still referred to as uh, continuing resolutions. And, and and I really uh, I wonder if why they're not using that terminology. Maybe there's so much change going on, or perhaps uh, uh, these are the leftover bills that weren't passed last time around with some additional changes made, and they're they're simply going to lash them all together as one big omnibus appropriations bill, <clears throat> uh, and and they consider the changes to have been large enough from the last spending measures that this isn't necessarily, this is less properly considered continuing previous appropriations. I don't know. I mean, I I think they could probably go either way with that, but uh, who knows? Uh, Inside the Capitol, they have their own terms of art. Anyway, uh, we've got this report from uh, Lesniewski over at uh, Roll Call. Starts this way. Senator Patrick J. Leahy has been an appropriator for decades. But the Vermont Democrat said Monday that for the first time in as long as he could remember, and and that's supposed to be a long time, 
He did not hear from the White House while working to craft an omnibus bill to fund the government for the rest of the fiscal year. Keeping President Donald Trump and his administration away from the nitty-gritty of the deal was, to Democrats, significant in getting to an agreement that includes all 11 of the remaining spending bills, and it was the House and Senate Appropriations Committee members and their staffs who did most of the work. The major win is that the key members of both parties in both bodies know if we really want to get this work to work, we do it the old-fashioned way. Like he said, a lot of work, a lot less rhetoric, but you get somewhere. There are a lot of Republicans who wanted increased funding for the National Institutes of Health. There were a lot of Republicans who wanted increased funding for transportation and education. Senate Minority Leader Charles Schumer said, I spoke to seven or eight Republicans who told me they were against the U.S.-Mexico border wall. So we knew that we'd have leverage there. And I guess that's one of the good reasons to keep the White House out of it, because they would be whipping their Republicans to go you know, and to throw it in reverse and back up to the White House position. Interesting. The New York Democrat talking a taking a bit of a victory lap said he found unity among his caucus in opposition to the wall, in part because rural state Democrats had discovered Mexico was responding to the threats and rhetoric from Trump by not buying as many crops from the United States. Hmm. The package does include a substantial increase in funding for other forms of border security, as Republicans were quick to highlight in this section entitled Something for Everyone. And uh, that's usually the the umbrella under which you'll find appropriations deals made when there's something for everyone. This legislation will allow us to substantially strengthen the border. It contains the largest increase in border security resources in a decade, allowing us to address high-priority security needs, crack down on illegal border crossings, and strengthen the border with everything from upgraded physical infrastructure, not a wall, but otherwise, and to high-tech biometric and surveillance technology, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said. Republicans who spoke up in support of the omnibus deal generally focused on their work to increase spending for either national security or key domestic priorities such as medical research. Senator Roy Blunt, who chairs the subcommittee that funds health and human services, pointed to the $2 billion increase for the National Institutes of Health. Uh, Republican Bill Cassidy of Louisiana highlighted the agreement's language providing funds to help with disaster recovery. Gee whiz, they, they seem to like that there. And like Democrats from coal country... Republican Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia touted the deal as a victory for her state in part because of the permanent solution for health care for coal miners, which I have seen Bill in Portland, Maine, helpfully trying to remind Democrats that they really need to take some credit for including that in the omnibus. And uh, if they don't, it's just political malpractice. Increased Democratic clout, eh? Okay, well, that's the next section here. I'm going to skip a little bit here to move along. A House Democratic leadership aide pointed to victories that went even beyond keeping out potentially toxic policy provisions with additional spending that the aide said came into the measure fairly late in the process. That included additional disaster relief and emergency transportation and infrastructure spending, as well as aid for health care needs in Puerto Rico, which was a priority of numerous Democrats, including House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi and Schumer were speaking from the same script, both publicly and privately, increasing the clout of the Democrats whose votes will be needed to pass the final deal. Speaking with reporter Schumer's claimed a messaging victory and making sure that responsibility for any potential government shutdown would fall at the feet of the GOP. That became the general consensus, and that gave us real leverage, even though we were in the minority, to get things done. And the Senate Minority Leader did not dismiss the idea that the bill was close to a complete win. Are there a few places? I guess which in, in which you would consider it a loss. Sure, but overwhelmingly we were pleased with the outcome on issue after issue, Schumer said. I would not say there's a major loss in here. Hmm. Appearing with Schumer on Monday afternoon, Leahy said the way Democrats were able to knock out 160 poison pill riders, 160 in the Republican proposal, demonstrates that at least among the grown-ups in both parties, in both bodies, they wanted to get down to doing it the way we are supposed to do. 
But a senior Republican aide said that despite Schumer's insistence, the Ryder debate is less significant with Trump in the White House, given that resolutions under the Congressional Review Act have already stopped some Obama-era regulations, and conservatives are able to take other administrative steps to try to roll back more of them. To that point, the White House press secretary, Sean Spicer, said Monday he has every expectation that Trump will sign the compromise omnibus spending measure, but said he would wait until the president has seen it (laughs) to say so definitively. And that seems like a smart play, even for Sean Spicer. Let's see. There are a few others here that uh, uh, I think speak to the same subject. The Washington Post has a piece here, Democrats confident they can block Trump's agenda after spending bill win. Uh, Here, uh, written by Kelsey Snell and John Wagner, uh, we'll see if there are a couple more fine points we can grab out of this one. Democrats, in fact, he says here, think they have set the stage to block President Trump's legislative priorities for years to come by winning major concessions in a spending bill to keep the government open. Pelosi and Schumer secured nearly $5 billion in new domestic spending by exploiting disagreements between Trump and Republican lawmakers over spending priorities. This is important. Democrats' lopsided victory on the five-month deal, which is likely to be approved this week, means it will be very difficult, if not impossible, for the GOP to exert its will in future budget negotiations, including when it comes to Trump's 2018 budget blueprint. That's because Republicans are hopelessly divided over how much to spend on government programs. With a small but vocal minority unwilling to support such measures at all, that has forced Republicans to work with Democrats to avoid politically damaging government shutdowns. Basically, all the things that uh, John Boehner found he had to do before his caucus got angry with him for doing them, ousted him, and replaced him with Paul Ryan, who uh, has proceeded to do exactly the same thing. But in a good way, somehow. I don't know. Nobody's talking about getting rid of them. That means Democrats are in the driver's seat when it comes to budget battles, even with Trump in the White House. Hmm. It's an optimistic view. I think we had a strategy and it worked, Schumer said in an interview with The Washington Post. Democrats and Republicans in the House and Senate were closer to one another than Republicans were to Donald Trump. Ah, that's certainly possible. The extra money for domestic programs will now be that much harder to strip out of future budgets, and Trump's priorities, such as money for a wall along the border with Mexico, could be more difficult to include. We can't pass anything without them, Senator John Cornyn of Texas, a top deputy to McConnell, said of Democrats recently. Hill Republicans remain skeptical of, if not openly hostile to, many of Trump's plans, including the wall and proposals to slash millions from programs such as the National Institutes of Health and Foreign Aid. In addition to the $5 billion in domestic spending, the partisan agreement released Monday, bipartisan agreement, uh, is packed with Democratic priorities, such as protection for funding for Planned Parenthood, a permanent extension of health care for coal miners, and money to help Puerto Rico make up a projected shortfall in Medicaid. Pelosi celebrated in a letter to House Democrats on Monday saying that the measure reflects significant progress defeating dangerous Republican riders and securing key victories for Democratic priorities. Republicans argued they were able to wrest several wins in the legislation, including greater increases in defense than domestic spending and an agreement to provide money for Puerto Rico if it was shifted from elsewhere and not new money. House and Senate leaders also believe that key changes to environmental policy were taken care of through administrative processes and they can further the anti-abortion goals through other budget proceedings. Nonetheless, Democrats are counting on Republican infighting over spending to guarantee that those parts of Trump's agenda won't be funded in the next spending deal either. So it all sounds pretty good. Uh, There's a, a little bit more detail here and then I guess some question over what the president's role in all of this really was. Uh, We have here Pence said to be celebrating the deal on Monday, saying Trump himself played a key role in reaching it. And I guess he has to say that. I think this morning's announcement about reaching a bipartisan deal on the budget says that the American people can be encouraged that Washington is working again, thanks to the strong leadership of President Donald Trump. Pence told CBS this morning, thanks to his direct engagement with members of Congress, 
for seeing real progress. But Trump's involvement was seen by many congressional aides as unhelpful to reaching a deal in the bipartisan talks. Negotiators were nearing an agreement on the spending portions and were ready to move on to unrelated policy measures when Mick Mulvaney publicly renewed demands that the bill include money for a wall along the southern border. That demand was out of sync with Republican leaders who long ago said they wouldn't seek any funding for the wall or cuts to sanctuary city funding. It also came weeks after Schumer personally told Mulvaney that the best way to avoid a government shutdown would be for the White House to stay out of budget negotiations and let Congress work its will. Hmm. And so it appears that they did. Let's end our discussion of that article and uh, move on. We may have to shift topics at some point here. Uh, And, uh, hmm. There's a Washington Post also had a report on what's in the spending agreement itself. And let's see if, uh, if there are other items that we haven't yet mentioned, we might as well bring ourselves up to speed on that and facilitate conversation tomorrow with Joan and Greg. There's also airport security money. TSA gets $331 million in additional money to hire new officers and canine teams, good for the dogs, to speed up the screening process at airports and seaports. And air travelers rejoice Congress decided against enacting a plan that would require $880 million in passenger fee increases. Amtrak, Joe, are you listening? Joe Biden, the nation's passenger rail service quasi-governmental organization, they note for us, gets $1.5 billion, a $105 million increase from the last budget year. Hmm. Arts funding. How about that? Democrats are claiming a huge victory for the arts. They successfully blocked Trump's request to cut funding for the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. Uh, Instead, both agencies would see a funding increase. Of $2 million under this spending bill, that's kind of small, but it's an increase, bringing each budget to $150 million for fiscal year 2017. We heard about border security issues. Uh, how about the Bureau of Land Management? Wow, in the Bundy era, how did they get it? How did they make out? Gone are requests for fee increases for ranchers, uh, grazing on federal land, and plans for increased oil and gas inspection fees. The BLM got $1.2 billion in the spending bill. An increase of $15 million over last year, including $9 million for the hotly debated Sage Grouse Conservation Project and federal land preservation. Hmm. Wasn't expecting that one. Uh, campaign finance gets some attention in this, too. Democrats say they used the spending bill to stave off attempts to end federal reporting of political contributions. But there's a ban on requiring government contracting firms to disclose political campaign contributions as a requirement for bidding on government work, ending an Obama-era push to do so. And the bill bars the SEC from requiring the disclosure of political contributions, contributions to tax-exempt organizations, or dues paid to trade associations, a loss for groups pushing for more disclosures of campaign contributions. The CDC gets a slight cut, though, $13 million dollars, uh, at the CDC, uh, though it does fully fund the public health preparedness and response programs, which are in charge of preparing for a bioterrorism attack or pandemic outbreak. Coal miners got what they had coming to them in the permanent extension of health care coverage, right? College tuition grants, Pell grants for college tuition get a boost to help cover the student's full year of college maximum award increased now to 5935 up just slightly from 5,775. Cuba has a little bit in here as well. Uh, you can uh, head, it, head it to the island nation, they ask. Bring back as many cigars as you'd like. Negotiators declined to include language barring Americans from bringing back merchandise from Cuba. Uh, more customs and border protection that came up in the earlier articles. The EPA program that helps communities clean up the water quality and their drinking water supply slated to remain fully funded at previous year's levels. The agency was responsible for sending $100 million to help Flint, Michigan, restore its drinking supply last year. Not not a done deal yet, eh? Hmm. Pentagon also takes $57 million additional million for water quality testing projects at military bases. Uh, what about the District of Columbia? $756 million from the federal government, the $26 million increase from last year, but $7 million less than what the Obama administration had requested. 
45 million for district school improvements. Uh, let's see, uh, some scholarship programs that help for low income students to attend private schools in the city. That's probably another way of naming vouchers. Don't know how wild we are about that. Education department, though, would see its budget trimmed. $68 billion now. $1.2 billion lower than 2016. Embassy security, no change in spending. Hmm, very interesting. E-cigarettes, how did they get in here? Uh, well, okay. Spending agreement requires FDA review of e-cigarettes, little cigars, cigarillos, hookah, and all cigar products. Hmm. Representatives Tom Cole of Oklahoma and Sandy Bishop of Georgia had been pushing to exempt thousands of e-cigarette flavors from federal review, according to congressional aides. Hmm. Well, uh, I guess, uh, hmm, let's see how, I can't tell what, what happens with this. The so-called deeming rule, interestingly enough, which was passed in 2016 and will be fully phased in by August 1st, 2018, requires any cigarettes introduced, e-cigarettes, since February 15th, 2007, to undergo an extensive certification process. Okay. EPA also uh, seeing some changes in here. So much for Trump's pledge to make deep cuts to the EPA. The spending bill would maintain nearly 99% of the agency's total budget. Still, Republicans are celebrating that the $8.06 billion EPA budget will force the agency to maintain staffing levels at 15000 the lowest since Ronald Reagan left office. The bill also bans the EPA from cutting agricultural exemptions under the Clean Water Act and requires an update on plans to address the backlog of mining permits that have yet to be permitted. They also cannot regulate lead in ammunition and fishing tackle that has led to eagle deaths and the poisoning of a wide range of animals. You'd think they'd really want to protect the eagle thing, but I guess since that eagle tried to bite Trump, He's been down on that. All right, what else? Executive orders get attention here. There's language in the bill requiring the Office of Management and Budget to detail the expected costs of executive orders and presidential memorandums. President Trump has signed 30 executive orders in the first 100 days of his presidency, a metric that means nothing. U.S. Geological Survey, there's an awful lot in here. Should we continue? Uh, we'll see if there's anything particularly interesting. But U.S. Geological Survey, uh, the money is up. Federal worker pay and perks. The bill continues to bar federal funding for abortions, gee whiz, as part of the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program. The bill also authorizes a pay freeze for the vice president and other senior political appointees. Fish and Wildlife Service gets $11 million more million. Food stamps, uh, now officially known as SNAP, of course, slashed. Bill slashes funding by $2.4 billion compared with last year. Wow, that's that hurts. Reflecting declining enrollment, so I guess that's good, according to Republicans, but I don't know. Overall, there's $78.5 billion in required mandatory spending for the program and another $3 billion for SNAP Reserve Fund that covers unexpected increases in enrollment. A $13.5 million spending increase for the Government Accountability Office to continue its investigative and oversight work, although they abandoned that job on the Trump Hotel, so $13.5 million for I don't know what. Guantanamo Bay, what do you know? They continue to bar transfer or release from Guantanamo Bay. Uh, immigration policy and funding. Trump won only a small boost in funding for ICE, the main agency in charge of deportations. Uh, ultimately, Democrats expect the new funding will bring the number of beds available for immigration detainees to 34,560, far less than the roughly 43,000 the Trump administration had requested. But a $1.5 billion spending increase for Justice Department will help pay for short-term detention space that Republicans demanded. What else? Uh, the IRS... <laughs> Well, their funding has been frozen in place because, of course, he's under audit. So, you know, something, something. Justice Department gets a $143 million spending cut. Key agencies like the FBI, DEA, and ATF, though, might see eight-figure increases. So cops get money, and people trying to uh, deal with the consequences of that in court get less, including, of course, the Legal Services Corporation. They, uh, I guess, 
remain in place, retaining a $385 million budget, uh, despite Trump's proposed elimination of the program. Library of Congress gets a little boost. Uh, oh, marijuana, yay. Uh, we all get some marijuana, that's nice. The spending bill bars the Justice Department from using any money to prevent local governments from implementing their own laws that authorize... Okay, so uh, federal supremacy on marijuana law, no surprise there. Uh, Metro Rail in Washington, D.C. area gets the money they were getting, stable, $150 million. Military contracting is addressed in here, military pay and perks, 2.1% pay raise for the troops. National parks fully funded, including a modest bump of $81 million for park maintenance, despite uh, all the threats from the administration. National Science Foundation, uh, let's see, uh, eh, apparently not much change. Dollar for dollar, about the same as last year. It says NASA, uh, $368 million bump in its $19.7 billion total. Uh, NIH, no cuts. Uh, oh, look at this, official portraits. The bill once again bans federal money from being used to paint the official portrait of any federal government official, including the president. But as you know, he likes to pay for that out of charitable, his charitable foundations anyway. Opioid addiction, big spending increase here, seen as one of the biggest bipartisan victories in the bill. $103 million specifically for opioid addiction reduction, in addition to the $130.5 million increase for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. Plus, they're going to bring in Duterte, and he'll kill as many of them as he can for free, he says. Planned Parenthood, we learned about that one. The uh, Republicans have uh, failed to defund them once again. Postal Service, uh, the bill prohibits the nation's mail delivery system from consolidating or, or closing small rural or other small post offices. Puerto Rico, we heard about. Public Broadcasting, Congress didn't make any cuts to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting after all. School Lunch Program, a new spending agreement ends a program championed by former First Lady Michelle Obama, of course. And uh, Republicans say the legislation stops an Obama-era school meal regulation, Grr, which we hate, and by in doing so provides flexibility for whole grains and milk and preventing changes to sodium standards that have not been fully scientifically vetted. The science is still out, I guess, on sodium. I think we... Have a pretty good idea about that one. Finally, uh, oh, let's see. We're getting, it's in alphabetical order, so we're getting towards the end. Security for President Trump. The spending bill includes $61 million in money to help pay back local law enforcement agencies for protecting Trump in the six months since he was elected. Any agency that provided protection to the president can apply for the reimbursement, but the majority of the funds are expected to be used by officials that protect Trump Tower in New York, where he hasn't gone and the president's Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach, where he hardly ever leaves. Uh, $131 million additional for the U.S. Secret Service to uh, help keep up with the increased deployments because of his extended family, let's say, and their travels all over the world. Smithsonian Institution gets a little money. That's nice. Uh, visas addressed under here. Bill includes at least two more years of funding to dole out the 2,500 special immigrant visas for Afghans who are employed by ISAF or the U.S. government in Afghanistan since military operations began there in 2001. And wildfires, our last subject, lawmakers from Western states secured $407 million in emergency funding to help fight wildfires this year. That wraps it up, and that frees up uh, a lot of time tomorrow for discussion with Joan, the nitty gritty all having been laid out there, we can talk about the politics of it all. Uh, let's see. As a matter of fact, one of the articles that Greg sent along this morning can get one or two of the political issues out of the way as well. Let's see. Did I... Uh, Put this one aside, or let's see, I want to flip back to uh, what was going on in our uh, discussion on Twitter. Mm, okay, yes, and he sent me some stuff last night, which I'll let me go over to Pocket here and get this out there. Now, switching topics, I believe, back over 
to uh, the health care bill. He sent me an interesting article in the National Journal, which was behind a paywall, but then he very helpfully sent me the uh, the text of the piece so that I could share it with you, which is kind of like stealing. But since Greg subscribes, you just imagine me reading this to you in Greg's voice, and then it's A-OK. I mean, Greg paid them for the article, and he just wants to share it with us. I mean, that's what I do here. Now, I'm not Greg, but you can pretend. Uh, of course, now I just figured out that uh, huh, small secret about the way Pocket sometimes works. It is paywalled. And if I go to, let me see, if maybe they took it out from behind their paywall because it was a good article. If I go to the original, does it let me in and show me the whole thing? No, it doesn't. But if I read it in a pocket view, it simply grabs all the text. I would say a note to National Journal, that's something they ought to fix in their software. But if we do that, then we wouldn't have this fun piece to share with you. Uh What's up with this one? This, uh, I think, grabbed his attention because Sarah Binder, of whom we are both big fans, was quoted in the piece. And I think we did a better job in terms of the thoroughness with which we explained the procedural issues surrounding the uh, Obamacare repeal and uh, I guess you could still call it a replace with the American Health Care Act uh, the, the Republican, the Trump care bill, uh, this is hardly even qualifies as replace, but okay. Um, still, uh, let's take a look at how they describe things here. And, uh, oh, I'm getting note from justice that our feed is, uh, fading in and out, dropping and, uh, and reestablishing periodically. So I apologize to those of you who are, uh, if we're back on listening live and for those of you who will have to uh, wait for the podcast, you'll have noticed nothing whatsoever. OK, well, uh, let's continue with the podcast portion of our show. Anyway, procedural fight could derail Obamacare repeal bill. Not too much new here, but we'll let the experts wrap things up here for us. The Senate's procedural rules. They helpfully inform us could kill House Republicans latest health care plan, even if the politics don't. But with pressure mounting to show progress on Obamacare repeal, House Republicans might not be especially focused on obstacles in the Senate. So although we know that reconciliation will make things extraordinarily difficult for them to get a bill through in any coherent fashion uh, and uh, might end up handing back the House a bill that they can't accept if the MacArthur Amendment is a must-have, and it, by all, you know, it certainly appears to be from all the reporting to date. Uh, it, it, the the political fallout from this may be that the House simply says we'll pass it the way we want it, uh, ignore the fact that the Senate cannot pass it in this fashion, and maybe simply just claim the House passage as victory enough, even if it doesn't become enacted law. And that was something that Greg hinted at last week when we discussed it, and it's looking like that might be what takes shape. As we were saying, with pressure mounting to show progress on Obamacare repeal, House Republicans might not be especially focused on the obstacles in the Senate. Molly Reynolds, a fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution, said a as pressure has increased, lawmakers are likely preoccupied with getting enough support just to pass legislation through the House. Spokesperson for House Speaker Paul Ryan said leadership had worked with the Senate throughout the drafting process to comply with the restrictions under the arcane budget reconciliation process. They're using reconciliation as their vehicle for health care reform because it wouldn't require any Democratic support. But even a party line vote has so far proven elusive. Experts question whether the most recent amendments in uh, the House bill, which brought the conservative House Freedom Caucus on board, will run afoul of the limitations on such bills and if and when it reaches the Senate. The amendment would allow states to apply for waivers from certain Obamacare regulations. The waivers would allow states to set their own essential health benefits, and they could permit health status underwriting for some consumers as long as the state met other requirements. States could also loosen the limitations on how much premiums could vary based on age. Sarah Binder, here she is fellow, senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings, again, 
said the newly proposed waivers could violate the Senate's Byrd rule. She said they could be seen as more of an effort to change policy than to directly affect government spending or revenues. So she sees a frontal assault from the Byrd rule uh, as we had known it even prior to last week's explainer that there might be a different section of the Byrd rule that ultimately does this amendment in. This is just straightforward uh, legislating in a, you know, uh, or, or you know, policy making in a reconciliation bill. It doesn't belong there. The Byrd rule prohibits provisions from being included in reconciliation bills if they do not produce changes in outlays or revenues or if those changes are incidental to a policy outcome, among other restrictions. The Senate parliamentarian determines whether specific policies are extraneous. Binder added, it's impossible to know for sure what would pass muster under these restrictions. And that's an important point. You can't tell for sure. It's always something of a question mark. It's impossible to know for sure what would pass muster under these restrictions unless the House passes the bill and the parliamentarian provides her insight. In other words, you got to pass the bill in order for the parliamentarian to be able to offer an opinion on whether or not it passes muster. It's really actually a terrible system. (laughs) All right. She said Republicans could argue that these changes affect government spending. They could argue that the waivers would lower consumers' premiums, which in turn would affect how much assistance they get from the federal government. However, Gregory Coger, a political science professor at the University of Miami, argued that the waivers would primarily change how the private insurance market works. He added that if the amendment had an effect on spending, it would be only an incidental one, and that's not the primary purpose of that provision. One expert said the parliamentarian previously appeared receptive to some insurance changes. My understanding was that the parliamentarian seemed to be receptive to the argument that changes in insurance regulations could comply with the Byrd rule if the change was limited to plans purchased with tax credits, because the provision could be considered a term and condition of the tax credit, said Ed Lorenzen, a senior advisor at the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. He added, though, that the parliamentarian never gave a definitive answer to that question, and regardless, the waivers in the latest House amendment would not be limited to plans purchased with tax credits. Making the change in regulations through state waiver authority makes the budgetary impact even more tenuous, since... It isn't the legislation that affects costs, but the state waiver. An argument can be made there would be no effect at all, direct or indirect, if no state applied for the waiver, Lorenzen said. State, uh, or rather Senate Democrats are certainly preparing for this possibility. Once again, House, Rep- House Republicans have made their bill worse for the health of the American people in order to buy off the Freedom Caucus and other conservatives. Matt House A spokesman for the Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer, said in a statement, but once again, that effort is almost certainly going to run afoul of the Senate reconciliation rules. Ensuring the bill with these provisions will need 60 votes to pass. There will not be 60 votes for a bill that drives up premiums and causes millions of people to lose their health insurance. Coger questioned how many senators would be able to support uh, the bill if key components were lost to the Byrd rule. As provisions start getting knocked out, it starts to lose the acceptability that it has. He added that the recent amendment attracted House Freedom Caucus members, and without it, conservative senators could oppose the bill, if they're consistent, that is. Conservative lawmakers, such as Senator Ted Cruz, have in the past pushed for a strategy that would overrule the Senate parliamentarian. In early March, Politico reported that Cruz was floating this strategy, insisting that it is the vice president who rules what is permissible under reconciliation. And the the House Freedom Caucus was pressing for something similar. But Coger said it's not clear the Republicans would have enough support to use that strategy and that some Republicans would feel that's moving too far toward abusing the standard procedures of the Senate. They did, after all, just use the nuclear option on the Supreme Court. And if you'll recall, we learned last year, everybody in the Senate hates Ted Cruz. So I'm not certain whether that's still the case. Maybe they hate Trump more. I don't know. Uh, either way, I can't imagine that uh, things have swung. The pendulum would have swung that much further towards nuking just about everything uh, if Ted Cruz is behind it. I don't know that he's the guy to push that thing. But but he's right. He has a point. You can do that. Uh, you can engineer it. And uh, it's just a question of whether or not you're 
willing to go that far. Ah, okay, so it looks like we may be back on the air for our live listeners. Welcome back. I just described uh, the answer to everything. You'll have to listen to the podcast to figure out what you missed, but it will be available shortly. We'll make it available. Uh, we usually get that thing posted at least at Libsyn by about 1130, so you won't have to wait too long to figure out what we were talking about in the interim. All right, let's see. What else can we squeeze in in the few minutes we have left here? Uh, hmm. Anything else that we need to do to lay a foundation for tomorrow's discussion with Joan and Greg? I think we've... We've got we've done a pretty good job explaining what's up in the spending bill and on the procedural issues still surrounding the health care bill. Yeah, I think we've done a pretty good job with that, and we should be ready to take that up tomorrow in more detail when Joan and Greg get here. Let's throw one more item into the mix then before we wrap things up uh, for the rest of the day here. This from the Wall Street Journal. And we may have to read this one in pocket view. And we'll see whether, well, no, it doesn't. It's interesting. I guess uh, they tease you with the availability of this information when you read it uh, somehow initially through Twitter. But when you put it away, uh, it, it uh, seems to fall apart. But here's, I'll give you just the headline then and we'll just move on to other issues. Uh, it seems Jared Kushner, once again, failure to disclose some key pieces of information uh, in his paperwork over at the White House, in addition to forgetting about talking to various Russians uh, and Russian officials uh, prior to the inauguration and during the transition. It seems Jared Kushner did not disclose a stake in a financial startup venture called Cadre, a tech startup apparently that pairs investors with big real estate projects. How fun. That apparently uh, just part of the portfolio that he failed to disclose. Uh, also including, let's see, what else? A number of loans from banks on properties that he co-owns, according to other securities filings. So why he would file with securities uh, folks and not with the White House, I have no idea. But I guess he just sort of figures he can get away with just about everything. I think he thinks he's one of those people that Trump just can't fire. And it might even be true. So why disclose anything? Well, gee whiz, I don't know. Uh, anybody else would have been fired at this point. So he may have a point. Okay, uh, let's see. Other fun things which we might be able to include in the roundup before we go. Let's uh, take a look back at this. This is something that I hinted at yesterday. And I included the uh, the article in the roundup for Scott's post, but uh, I probably should have read a little bit more from it. We discussed the idea of it, and this will be a, a topic of discussion again tomorrow, I'm sure. But yesterday we mentioned with Greg uh, that this was the case. I have Sarah Cliff's piece for Vox. An interview suggests Trump doesn't know what's in his health bill. Either the president doesn't understand the proposal or isn't telling the truth about it. And then, of course, 10,000 tweets to Sarah Cliff saying, couldn't it be some combination of both? Of course it could. It's just a headline. President Donald Trump gave a lengthy interview Sunday to CBS's John Dickerson about the Republicans' health care plan and many other things. Uh, we all got the highlight about him refusing to answer the question about surveillance, right? His response to basic questions like what provisions the bill includes or how it would change the health insurance system suggests he either doesn't understand how the American Health Care Act works or doesn't want to tell the truth about it. Hmm, could be either or both. Dickerson is the first journalist I have seen grill Trump on what exactly is in the Republican plan. He isn't talking about the politics of the bill and whether it will pass. Rather, he focuses on what are arguably basic questions. What elements are in this bill and what do you think of them? Trump stumbles. He says that people with pre-existing conditions will be protected. Under the latest amendment to the American Health Care Act, the one that got the Freedom Caucus on board, they won't be. He says the deductibles will go down under the Republican plan. Nonpartisan analysis expects deductibles would go up. The health care plan that Trump described on Face the Nation is not the one that the Republican Party has offered. His answers suggest an unfamiliarity with the basic policy details of the plan that has been public for nearly six weeks at this point a plan that his administration has pushed Congress to pass. 
Forget about the little S word. He actually says that Trump reportedly told a room full of legislators during the health care negotiations, let's focus on the big picture here. His answers on CBS suggest that if he actually read the Republican bill, he wouldn't find it. He would find it sorely disappointing and at odds with his health care goals. Hmm. Much of the Trump interview centers on Trump claiming that new changes to the Republican health care bill will protect people with pre-existing conditions. But in fact, it's actually the exact opposite. An amendment to the AHCA introduced this week would give states authority to let insurers charge sick people higher premiums. Dickerson starts with a relatively simple question. That is basically, how will this bill help your supporters? Here's Trump's response. Pre-existing conditions are in the bill. And I just watched another network than yours, and they were saying pre-existing is not covered. Pre-existing conditions are in the bill, and I mandate it. I said, has to be. And of course, it is. They mention the words pre-existing conditions, maybe, in the, in the sense that, yeah, you can. You, they, they don't have to be in this bill. Trump uh, knows there were changes to the bill, but he gets them all backwards, insisting that the updates strengthen protection for sicker patients. This bill is much different than it was a little while ago, okay? The bill has evolved, and we didn't have a failure on that bill. You know, it was reported like a failure. Now, the one thing I wouldn't have done again is put in a time, put on a timeline. That's why on the second iteration, I didn't put a timeline. But now we have pre-existing conditions in the bill. We have, we've set up a pool for the pre-existing conditions so that the premiums can be allowed to fall. They don't. He's got it wrong. It's backwards. And it's just one of several examples cited in this article. I recommend it to you, but I must wrap up now and hand the microphone over to the guys getting ready to bring you the after show with all, uh, uh, well, with any luck anyway, <laughs> which has eluded me to this point without interruption. Still not exactly sure what caused our little interruption here. I apologize to you for that, but that's the vagaries of broadcasting, quote unquote, over the Internet. Anyway, there's uh, plenty coming up here. And as a matter of fact, uh, the, through the magic of the Internet, I do have a preview for you. Uh, of the after show with Wink and Justice, which will be coming up next. Let's roll some nice background music and give ourselves an opportunity to prepare our minds for the after show. Uh, are there any headlines that they are able to cram in that we didn't get to? Let's see. We were pretty good about the headlines today, although we didn't get to the Jimmy Kimmel thing, in case you've all seen that. Let's see. What's up next on the after show? Probably because they have survived for almost 3,500 years and are a perennial favorite of Americans, Trump now plans to kill off the Sequoia Redwoods. What a great idea. Everybody hates those trees. In another attempt to sabotage the Affordable Care Act, the Trump administration will defray the costs of Florida refusing Medicaid expansion. And Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross was coy about whether Trump had chocolate cake during the Syrian missile strike after dinner entertainment. Well, as you know, uh, Wilbur Ross considered the Sago mine disaster or something of an appetizer for himself, so this is no surprise. What about on the last half? Another visit with Chris Reeves, who you may know as Tim Servo, Tom Servo 433, for a discussion on how the meta attacks on each other is not focusing on immediate action that is needed now. And we're talking about relitigating the primaries, of course, and uh, his admonition that we not continue to do so. Technology products will see dramatic price increases thanks to Trump. And they didn't call Andrew Jackson a genocidal maniac because they were being polite, you know. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. All of that plus the Connect Unite Act Daily Coast Community Calendar and more on the after show with Wink and Justice. And I just realized what a fun twist I gave to that last line. Very interesting. It's actually the case that they didn't call Andrew Jackson a general subtle maniac in their interviews because they were being polite. One of the most polite things Trump has done yet. Stay tuned.